Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming. I think I'm the uh, last presentation standing between you and lunch. So I'm going to get started and get you guys out to lunch. Probably not early, but um, hopefully on time. So uh, the title of my talk is Semantic and Multilingual Strategies in Lucene and Solar. And uh, to give you a quick overview of what we're going to be talking about today, uh, I'll give a quick introduction about myself and my company, Career Builder. Um, give you a really quick refresher on text analysis. Most of, most of you guys are probably um, reasonably sophisticated with that, so I won't spend much time on it. Uh, then I'm going to dive into the heart of the talk, which is going to be multilingual search. So I'm going to talk about uh, how you handle language for each specific language if you have to support multiple languages in your search application. Uh, and then I'll go into some strategies for when you need to go beyond a single language and need to be able to support many languages either per document, uh, per field in some cases, or sometimes um, uh, across multiple collections. Uh, I'll briefly touch on language identification uh, and how you can do that automatically in Solar. And then finally, I'll wrap up with some work that we're doing right now regarding t uh, semantic understanding of queries as they come in and how those are best represented and turned into queries to enhance relevancy and find the best results. So quick intro to me. I am the co-author of Solar in Action. I've seen a bunch of you guys walking around carrying it. Hopefully, it's been a useful tool for you guys since it was released earlier this year. Uh, I also work for Career Builder, have worked there since 2007, and I'm the director of engineering for search and analytics there. So we have a large search team. Uh, many of our products, which you'll see in just a minute, are powered off of solar, uh, and we've been in the solar community for uh, several years. Um, I got my master's from Georgia Tech and various other um, institutions I've been at, and I'm also the uh, founder of a gluten-free search engine called Silly Access. If any of you guys eat gluten-free or know someone who does, it's a good resource for that. Getting some claps from the audience. Uh, quick blurb about Career Builder. We're heavy users of solar. 90 plus percent of our products use solar, so if you're familiar with us, we power consumer job search experience. We use solar to power resume searching, uh, autocomplete capabilities across our site. Our job recommendation engine, uh, similar to the last talk, um, is built on solar, um, using solar as um, a giant uh, matrix in memory. Uh, we use solar for resume recommendations, for analytics across employment uh, market information, um, so supply and demand of labor, uh, skill sets, compensation, those kinds of things you would expect from an employment website, uh, and various other search capabilities just all, all across our site, um, including some fairly sophisticated data analytics capabilities where you can type in keywords and categories and really zoom in on any aspect of the market, uh, whether it's where to find labor, what compensation should be, um, or how e if, if it's getting harder or easier to find specific skill sets over time. So that's about Career Builder. Uh, this talk isn't really about Career Builder very much. It's more about multilingual search. So I'm just going to dive right in. And I'm going to go fairly quickly through these first few slides um, because I'm hoping most of you guys have this information already. So a quick refresher on text analysis. In Lucene and Solar, you uh, basically have three stages when you create an analyzer. You've got uh, care filters which are optional. Um, you can have zero or more of those. There's, um, and, and the purpose of those is to be able to take incoming text and clean it up before tokenization. After you've run those stages, you uh, pass the incoming text into a tokenizer. There's one tokenizer, and it is responsible for splitting the text that's coming in, that comes in as a reader, and splitting it into multiple tokens to be processed further. After you've done the splitting, uh, you then have a series of token filters, and those token filters uh, can be put in any order, and they operate on each individual token, modifying it as needed. So in the example here, uh, this is from Solar in Action. There um, is a character filter at the top, a white space tokenizer, and then various other, uh, various other token filters that happen after it, including a stimmer at the bottom, which is for English called the case stimmer. basic text analysis in Solar. What you can see from having all those stages, though, is that Solar is very configurable, um, and Lucene is very configurable. You can apply those stages in any order you want. 
And so this is an example of two different English uh, fields that were defined to handle English text. Uh, the one on the left uh, uses a standard tokenizer, does stop words, lower casing, removes apostrophe S's, uh, and then uh, passes the text to a fairly aggressive English stemmer called the Porter Stem Filter Factory. The uh, one on the right is a field that is made for information coming from the web. So the first thing we do is run it through an HTML stripping character filter to remove HTML before any of the tokenization happens. Uh, there's a synonym again, split on um, different delimiters, remove accents, go through the case number, et cetera. These are all configurable. You can put them in any order. And if you go to Solar in Action, we've got an appendix in there that goes through 32 different languages and different combinations of um, stimmers and token filters and, and all those kinds of things that you can apply. But the important point I want to get across is that every language is different and has to be hand handled differently. So in this case, I've got Arabic up here. You see there's some custom Eric normalization. Uh, there's a, a filter specifically for Arabic normalization before the stimmer. Romanian's a very basic uh, analyzer you see set up here. Uh, Persian has its own character filter that needs to be run before the text even goes into the tokenizer. And then it's got two different normalization filters that get applied. If I switch over to Japanese, um, because of the kind of language it is as a CJK language, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, uh, there's a lot of other stages that get introduced. I look at Hindi, I look at Greek. Uh, they all have their own custom needs based upon the language. And so, Sometimes people ask me, hey, if I need to support multiple languages, can't I just take multiple stemmers and just put them in the same field and just hope it works? Uh, you can, you shouldn't. Uh, you're not gonna get good results. You're gonna have the stemmers stepping on each other. And as you can see, it's a very complex process to tie these things together in the correct fashion to make sure you get optimal results for your language. So because of that, uh, there's some different multilingual search strategies, which I'll talk about uh, in a few slides, which I would encourage you to pursue instead. One of the other questions that uh, when we were writing Solar in Action, um, I kept coming across was, um, hey, there's all these different stimmers, which one do I choose? How do I know which one's the right one for my use case? Some of them are very aggressive, some of them aren't. And so this table uh, up here shows uh, from least aggressive to most aggressive, sort of the categories of stimmer. So in your domain, if you want to be very aggressive and trying to pull back a lot of results, even if there's some noise there, you basically want to optimize for recall instead of over precision, then you would want to use a more aggressive stimmer. Um, otherwise, if you want to be very, very precise, then you would use a less aggressive stimmer, and that way you're doing minor adjustments, like removing plurals and those kinds of things without significantly modifying the words coming in. So um, just keep that in mind uh, in terms of that spectrum of different kinds of stimmers. And basically, on the far left for least aggressive, you have the minimal stem filters, then you have the light stem filters, which are a little bit more aggressive, uh, and then you've got the regular stemmers that. You uh, or for the language, and then the most aggressive typically, if the language you're looking at supports the snowball porter simmer, that thing's really aggressive, and um, it'll tend to be the most aggressive you'll see. And so some examples in English where the stimmers are being applied. I've got three highlighted on here. Uh, this particular graphic's from Solar in Action. Uh, association is the first one. You see the porter simmer, which is aggressive. Uh, puts that down to ASS OCI, and also associates get stemmed to the same thing. So if you use the porter stemmer, association and associates are the same word, even though they don't actually mean the same thing. Versus if you go to the minimal stemmer, you'll see that association and associate are kept as their own independent words. So if you don't want association to match associates, you probably shouldn't use the porter stemmer because it's too aggressive. Similarly, you'll see something like organizations, organize, and organic, which are all three very different words. Uh, for the porter stemmer, they all map down to the word organ. So if you want an organ donor who can organize something for an organization, um, then great. Um, but if that's not what you're looking for when any of those, user wor those words are used, uh, the porter stemmer might be a little too aggressive for you. And with any of these stemmers, there's gonna be cases where the stemmer doesn't do exactly what you want it to. And so thankfully, in Solar and Lucene, there's the ability to override the stimmers. If you want to use a stimmer but have a specific rule you want to uh, 
you want to apply, you can either make use of the keyword marker filter, which allows you to protect a list of words from ever being stemmed, or you can use what's called the stemmer override filter, which allows you to specify a list of custom mappings, and that makes sure that a specific term will stem to um, a, sp a specific term that you identify. Uh, and so those are two ways that you can override what you get by default with the stemmers if you have some use cases for that. An alternate strategy, um, if you want, is to use something like limitization. And so limitization, as opposed to stemming, uh, is allowing you to find the dictionary form of a word. So it's, it's lemma means root, so the root form. So there's a lot of commercial organizations. At Karubura, we use basis technology. Um, they're used by a lot of leading companies out there and you can actually download their software uh, free for development use and then um, you pay them when you wanna go to production. But uh, they can provide a lot of value there. And the real value you get from stemming versus limitization is that when you stem, an algorithm is being applied to the text that you're looking at. And so uh, whatever that algorithm says goes, it really has no understanding of the individual words coming in versus with limitization, each word that comes in is treated as something that could be looked up in a dictionary and that dictionary form is what gets mapped to. So some examples that I have up here, um, for example, the word generations, if you pass that into uh, say the snowball or pass into the Porter stem filter, it, go, it becomes Jenner. If you pass generals in, it becomes Jenner, several, sever, severity, sever. But if you pass it into a limitizer, it's gonna understand what that word actually means and what its root form is and map down to that. So effectively, when you use limitization, you optimize uh, for precision without significantly hurting recall, if, if you wanna think of it that way. It also tends to cost money because it's mostly commercial organizations who provide these things. So that's a general overview of language handling in solar, which most of you guys are probably familiar with already. Uh, what I wanna get into now is how you handle multi multilingual content. And so what happens if every document that comes in has a different language? How, how do you represent that in terms of a document and in terms of the query? What happens if you have multiple languages within the same document? Or what happens if you have multiple languages in the same field? And so, there's three strategies that I'm gonna walk through for handling these different scenarios. Uh, the first is the most common, which is having a separate field for every language that you support. The second is, uh, one of the, is the least common, probably of the three, which is having a separate collection for every language that you support. And the third is trying to put all of the different languages in a single field and have the analyzers um, still work on a per language basis. So the first strategy, which many of you have probably uh, utilized, uh, has the idea of having a separate field per language. So I have an a field defined in my schema called my English field, a field defined that's the Spanish field, and a field defined that's the German field. And then I index the data into the appropriate field, and whenever I go to run my query, I just search across all three fields. In Solar, if you're using the edismax query parser, it's very easy because you can just specify a um, query field to search across all your fields. And so the way you would set up this kind of scenario is uh, you have a schema with each of these three fields with their own separate analyzers defined. Um, so in this case, content English, content French, and content Spanish. You index some documents. Uh, in this case, uh, I just highlighted the parts that are important, but there's a document for the adventures of Huckleberry Finn, a document for Les Mis, and a document for Don Quixote. And uh, I pass that content in and when it goes into solar, it gets indexed into its own field, and then my query just becomes a query for uh, content under, uh, to, to search across the fields, content English, content French, and content Spanish. Uh, when I do that, um, if the text in any of those fields matches, the document comes back, and so in this example where I search for a piece of text from every one of those documents, uh, all three of the documents came back, and the individual fields were searched on for each document, and that's why it matched. This is the most common way to do multilingual search in Solar, and it's very flexible. Um, there's some um, strengths and weaknesses, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, but here's a more uh, advanced scenario. In this case, I've got um, the Book of Proverbs, um, and I've actually taken three different translations of the Book of Proverbs and put them in the same document. 
So in this case, if you've got a scenario where you've got documents where you have multiple translations and want to be able to search across them, you can index all three translations on the same document. And when you run your search across the three different uh, fields, you'll be able to match based on any language that was typed in. And so in this example, I've got three different queries listed. Query one, which searches an English word. Query two, that searches a Spanish word. And query three, that searches a French word. And all three of these searches will yield the exact same results, which is finding this document. So the advantages of this separate field per language approach are that it's the simplest method to use out of the box. It just requires some basic configurations. Uh, it's built in, has built in support for searching across, Solar has built in support for searching across fields um, using an Edis Max query parser. Uh, language detection, which I'll talk about in just a bit, is um, fairly easy and it works out of the box. Uh, the disadvantage is if you end up having many, many languages, your query becomes very long and slow because you're basically doing an Aura query across many fields uh, on every search. And so uh, it, well, you'll hit scale issues at some point if you're trying to support dozens or hundreds of languages. Also, um, for mixed, if you have actual mixed language content where you've got multiple languages in the same field, uh, it's very hard to do uh, cross language phrase searching and those kinds of things. That's a pretty uh, rare use case that I won't talk about here, but there, there's some disadvantages. The second strategy, which um, there's special use cases for, but most people will never go this route, is to actually have a separate collection for each language that you support. So in this case, you have an English language collection, you have a German language collection, you have a Spanish language collection, and when documents come in, you route them to the appropriate collection. And then at query time, you search across all the collections. So as an example for how to set this up, um, for each, uh, I've used cores in this case, but for each collection, you define a field with the same name. In this case, the name is content. So I use an English analyzer in the English collection, a Spanish analyzer in the Spanish collection, and a French analyzer in the French collection, um, all mapping to a field called content. Then I send my documents in, um, and I just have a content field on each document, and I route it to the appropriate language specific core. Um, if you're using Solar in Action, you can use these commands to index some example documents. Um, and then when I send my query in, I don't actually have to worry about language at all. So this, this scenario is really, really good if at query time you don't know what the language of your user is, and especially if you have many languages you have to search across and don't want to pay the cost of searching across multiple fields, uh, this is a good strategy for that because I'm language agnostic at query time. Um, so again, the, the pros, fast search across many languages, you're language agnostic, uh, and it also supports any query parser you want to use. You don't have to use the Edis Max query parser to search across multiple fields. You can search with just the Lucene query parser or any other query parser, and it'll just work. Uh, the cons are there's no built-in support for routing. Um, like if you're doing automatic language detection in Solar, there's no built-in support for routing based upon that today. So you, today you largely end up in a scenario where you have to route documents yourself and manage all the cores per language and that becomes a, a big hassle over time. Also, uh, in certain scenarios, you can end up with suboptimal relevancy results because on a per language basis, you have different TF-IDF values and um, those scores will calculate differently across cores, so one language might grossly outweigh another language if you're doing a distributed search. Strategy three is having a single field for all of the languages you support. So this is the most complex of the strategies, and I'm gonna walk you through how it works, but the gist of it, if you can see up on the screen, is every document goes in, it's on a single core, and all the content goes into a single field. In this case, the field's called content. Uh, and the way that you differentiate what language analyzer you wanna use on the content is by passing in prefixes for the content going in. So in this case, I pass in a document, I say that I want it to be processed in English and Spanish in the content field, and the next one I pass in a document and I say I want it to be processed in English and German, and the last one in uh, Greek and Chinese. And then at query time, I can do the same thing. I can say, hey, this query, I want it to be processed in English and German. Uh, and so this requires some custom code um, that's not in Solar yet. Um, the code is available with Solar in Action, and we walk through some examples you, that you can play with. Uh, and I'm, there's a JIRA for it, and I'm working on it in my free time. 
But the gist of it is that there's a custom field type, and that field type allows you to tell it dynamically which analyzers you want to use on every document and on every query request coming in. So uh, this could be extended to some other things. For example, uh, that you could do things that aren't language specific, like create a field in which you want to index bigrams, trigrams, and quadgrams, and then at query time, choose to only search on the bigrams or only search on the quadgrams. Uh, there, there's some other ways you could do this, just having the ability to dynamically modify the analyzers that are being used on any given query or document. But multilingual is one of the big use cases you could think of for this. We want to put multiple languages in the same field, but have each language use a language-specific analyzer. So to do this, uh, using the examples from Solar in Action, you basically define a field type. I'm calling it multilingual text here. Uh, within that field type, I give mappings that say the prefix en maps to the field type text English. The prefix es maps to the uh, field type for Spanish. Fr maps to text French. And de maps, maps to text German. When I pass my documents in, in each field, I can tell it which languages I want it to uh, process the text in. And then when I send my search, I tell uh, the query parser which uh, languages I want the uh, text to be processed in as well. Very, very flexible. You do have a lot of options to shoot yourself in the foot if you change the analyzers in an incompatible way. But you could also, at query time, search with no analyzer, and if the word got stemmed and it's an exact match, it would still match. It wouldn't be ideal, but, but it works. So this gives you the ultimate flexibility for how your content is indexed. Um, and so just as an example, um, if you're curious about the internals of how this capability works, um, for each language, um, a field type is chosen based upon the um, prefixes that are passed in. The analyzer for that language is then pulled out and the text is passed independently into each analyzer. And then at the end, once you have a token stream from each of the analyzers, those token streams are combined together and stacked based upon the position increments so that the words will tend to line up across the languages. Um, if you guys have questions about that, um, I'm not gonna go into it now, but feel free to um, come ask me afterwards or um, there's a good detailed description in Solar in Action. Which by the way, I've got a couple of free copies of um, I'm gonna, af after the talk's over, um, I'll take questions for a few minutes. If you guys have some good questions, you might get a free copy. So the advantages of the putting all languages in a field approach are that it supports any combination of languages in a single field. It works in a single solar core or sh sharded solar setup, so it'll work with solar cloud. It supports any query parser, not just the EDIS Max query parser. Um, and it also supports true multilingual searching, including mixed language phrases. So if you've got, um, say, a document, it's a weird use case, but maybe every, every fifth word, every second word is English and then Chinese, and then English and Chinese, and then German, and then Greek. If you've really got true mixed language content, and you process it in each of those languages, you could actually do a phrase query within the same field across multiple languages. I can't think of a really good use case for that, but it, it is possible to do true mixed language uh, proximity searching. Um, and then some of the cons, the biggest con is that it's not available out of the box. It's also fairly complicated, as you can see from the query syntax and the documents going in. So I wouldn't recommend you use this approach if you've got just a basic uh, use case of needing to search across a couple of fields, but um, it's there for you if you've got more sophisticated use cases. Uh, I've Got some information here about automatic language detection, which I'm gonna just mention. Um, it's in the slides uh, for reference later, but because of time, I'm not gonna spend much on it, other than just to say, uh, when you pass documents to Solar, it's possible to dynamically identify the languages on those documents. Um, so in this particular case here, I'm defining the uh, language detect, language identifier update processor. And then I pass my documents in for Huckleberry Finn, Les Mis, and Don Quixote, and uh, it, I end up with these additional fields on the document that have identified the language, which can be useful for various things, including faceting, if I wanna search on a particular language, those kinds of things. Um, additionally, if you're using that first approach we talked about, where you have a separate field per language, you can use the language identifier to automatically take content from an incoming field, like a content field and you can map it to language-specific fields to make 
query time, searching across them, uh, easy without you having to know the languages up front. So you can use Solar to do the language detection and still make use of the first strategy that we talked about where every language has its own field. And you just map, the, Solar will map the data into the language specific field for you. Uh, so the last section that I wanna go into is talking about some of the stuff we're doing at Career Builder right now, uh, moving beyond just multilingual support, which we've had for uh, years because we support dozens of languages across uh, probably 40 different markets. But the issue we have with Lucene and Solar right now, which I'll, I'll show here, is that uh, the way it parses queries is not super intelligent. So let's say that what you see up here on the screen is a user inner query. In this case, it's machine learning, research and development, Portland, Oregon, software engineer, and Hadoop, Java. If a user typed that query in, then this is how Lucene and Solar would parse it traditionally. It would become machine and learning and research and development and Portland, or as a Boolean operator, software and engineer and Hadoop and Java. Um, you'll get probably relevant results at the top if the relevancy scoring moves them to the top, but what you're filtering on is not really what you meant. What you would ideally want to do is parse the query out more like this. Machine learning and research and development in Portland, Oregon, and software engineer and Hadoop and Java. So basically having a notion of what those terms mean within your domain. And once you've got that understanding of what the terms mean, you can do something even more intelligent, which is expand out the query to include the meaning of what the user searched for, not just the text. So in this case, I know what machine learning is, and I know that other related terms to it include data scientist, data mining, computer vision. I know what research and development is. I know that Portland, Oregon is a location, and so I can not only search on that text, but I can also search for a radius around the city of Portland, Oregon. Um, by understanding, basically doing entity extraction on the queries and documents as they come in, you, and, and running that entity extraction on the query before you pass it to Solar, you can do things like this. So we've started to do that at Career Builder. We're, um, in, we're still rolling out some of this technology, but I wanted to walk you quickly through what we're, the, the way we're approaching it. Um, and the first step, which I've talked about in some other presentations, you can find them online, is mining our user search logs to try to identify the most common phrases and entities in our domain. Once we find those phrases and entities, we correlate them with other searches that the same people have done to find related terms and phrases. Once we've built up this taxonomy of known and important terms and what they're related to in our domain, we do additional things like classify them using uh, technology provided by our data science team to um, normalize job titles and to, uh, to uh, find skills and various other things that are domain specific for us. But for that first phase, which is keywords going in and us doing entity extraction, we're actually making use of an open source project called the Solar Text Tagger, which uh, uses the Lucene FST um, data structure internally. And I'm not gonna get into the details of that, but the gist of it is we can take this original query, pass it into the FST that has all of the terms that we care about in our domain, and effectively use the Solar Text Tagger to highlight where in that query each of the terms appeared. So we can say that uh, the term software engineer in that query um, was found, and it was found starting at position one and ending at position 18. Hadoop was found starting at position 23 and ending at 29, et cetera. We can then substitute in that query tokens representing the entities that were found, parse the query as normal, and then inject the related meaning wherever we had that token before. Um, and so this is, a high level view of the architecture for what we're doing, but uh, the gist of it is when you pass in a keyword like machine learning as part of a query, we'll extract that out as a known entity hitting the FST. We will then pull back all of the related meanings that we found uh, through Hadoop and through MapReduce and machine learning processes to discover those relationships. And then we inject those relationships into the query um, using the best Solar has to offer from a relevancy standpoint to generate the best results coming back. Not just matching on text, but really matching on the meaning of what the person typed in in their query. Uh, there's a lot of interesting things in the domain related to um, finding related search terms um, in terms of understanding synonyms, ambiguous terms, and related terms. I've spoken about this in some other presentations you could find online. Um, 
but then our overall goal is to be able to take, take all this information and tie it back into a user interface where our users could actually interact with it. So in this case, if you type in the keyword Hadoop, we can understand the job titles, the occupations, and the keywords, related keywords associated with that, and then expand those out and ultimately provide this information back to our users so that they can interact with the data and add things they want to add, they can delete things they want to delete. But we're really trying to create a, um, an augmented search experience for our end users, not just do everything behind the scenes, but really allow them to drive it. Um, so that's the, that's the, um, the gist of the presentation, and um, I just wanted to say we are hiring at Career Builder. If any of this stuff sounds interesting to you, uh, we've uh, between our search and data science groups, we've um, done a lot of research this year. These are all books and publications we've had this year in this space, um, and um, I think we're um, at lunch now. So I'm going to quickly summarize just to say that um, for language analysis, every language. Um, the language options are very configurable in Solar, so you want to make sure you fine-tune them for each language. Don't just put everything in, um, don't just create a single analyzer for all your languages. Uh, there's multiple strategies for handling multilingual content uh, based upon your use case. Uh, there is automatic language detection if you need it in Solar, which can aid you in that process. And in my opinion, the next generation of query and relevancy improvements are going to come from being able to really understand the query the user is typing in and to generate a better query and ideally allow the user to interact with uh, what you've done. So here's my contact information. We are hiring a career builder. If you're interested, come talk with me. Um, it's lunchtime now, so I think lunch is um, d directly across if you want to go to lunch. Also, since I'm the last speaker before lunch, I have the luxury of not having a time constraint, so I'm happy to take a few questions um, if anybody has them. Sure. So your question was, what is our approach to assessing quality for our multilingual capabilities? Are, are you asking specifically about um, the multilingual like stemmers and that kind of stuff? Or are you talking about the semantic relationships I was talking about at the end? Oh, the semantic, I imagine, is even more difficult, but just, just the stemming part. Is sure. So we, uh, my answer is a cop-out, which is we pay basis technology to do that for us. Um, and occasionally we have some issues and we have to create overrides based upon user feedback, but we, we mostly outsource the text understanding and the, the root form analysis. For the semantic capabilities where we understand the terms and phrases, we um, have machine learning processes that generate everything. Uh, they flow back into a system that data analysts think can then go in and edit and modify. And as they modify them, we pull that information back into the machine learning processes to help additionally train and make them better. Um, and as we release this to end users um, and allow them to interact with the data, we'll also be able to get the additional feedback loop of users who tell you, hey, this term, I don't want to have it as part of my search, and I want to add these other terms. And in aggregate, we can use that to modify the, our understanding of those relationships. Um, yeah. So the question was, how do we handle mixed mode uh, language cases? Uh, words like Hadoop that will appear in English and Chinese and, and very, basically across languages because they're not language specific. Uh, the answer to your question is, out of those three strategies, we actually use the third, where we put all of the content in a single field. Um, and because of that, uh, we don't have that issue because you know English and Chinese are all sitting side by side. Yep. I'm going to give you a book. Do you have one? All right, I've got one more book up here too, so ask a couple more good questions, then I'm gonna set you guys free for lunch. You can go, by the way, you don't have to stay if you, if you are hungry. Uh, I, I couldn't quite hear. Great 
question is how do we integrate the ontology and the dictionary into solar? Uh, we don't. So we, in our architecture, we actually um, have our own query parser in our application layer that, that's custom to Career Builder uh, that we parse everything through first. So um, if you wanted to integrate it, you um, could um, integrate it with a token filter or possibly an update processor for documents. Um, or most likely you would write a custom query parser inside Solar. So we've, we've effectively written our own custom query parser. Uh, we just parse the query outside of Solar before it goes in, but you could do it in Solar as well. Uh, to be able to, for example, for the semantic capabilities, to be able to extract out using the FST um, entities that we're going to search on, uh, you would have to write a custom query parser to be able to do that today. I'm sorry, I'm having trouble hearing. Are there any? The question is, are there any open source products to do what I was talking about where we identify the entities and the relationships and all of that? Um, I'm sure there are. I'm not aware of them. We're basically doing log analysis. So effectively, we're doing collaborative filtering on related terms within our user query logs. Um, I think my guess is that in Lucidworks Fusion, they're probably doing some similar things uh, or probably will in the future. But that's not really open source. So. I don't, I don't know of any, but maybe if someone else here knows some open source capabilities for mining query logs, they can help you out. Um, the question is, are we using WordNet or anything like that for the dictionary? Um, the answer is no. We're, we're, mining, um, we're mining our logs and generating our, our, our own dictionaries. And in our domain, the WordNet dictionaries um, are useful in some cases, but there's a lot of domain-specific terms for us in the employment market that just wouldn't appear in a normal dictionary. Um, a lot of proper nouns and things like that, skills, names of open source projects, those kinds of things. So, all right. I'm going to do two more questions, then I'm going to set you guys up for lunch. Hold on. Uh, right, this guy. Um, we, so the question is, um, we built our own query parser, are we creating custom queries or are we just using Lucina Solar directly? Uh, what we do in our applications, we have our own parsing rules. We parse things into our own query tree structure and then we turn around and generate a Lucene query out of that. So we don't actually use the, the Dismax query parser, for example. Uh, we use just the native Lucene syntax to generate all the queries from our application. Uh, just for performance reasons. Um, there's some really cool things in the Dismax query parser, so we have considered possibly switching to it to gain some of those advantages, but uh, today we parse the query ourselves and map it into Lucene syntax. And you can do all the same things you can do with the Dismax query parser in Lucene syntax, it's just a lot more complicated. All right, um, last question. So the question is, I think for the third strategy, uh, where we're putting all the languages in one field, um, do we reparse, reprocess the content in every language? And, or if not, how do we handle stop words and those kinds of things? And the answer is, uh, the incoming text gets passed independently to every analyzer. So for example, if I've got a field and I've said, process this in English and German and Chinese, it will pass the text independently to each of those analyzers and get a list of tokens out that ran through that whole analyzer. And then we just stack those and index them all together. Yeah, yeah, if, if, yeah, if, if we were doing an, um, th the question is, is in a multi-valued field where we're putting all the languages in, um, 
if you, if you use and like we for Solar in Action, there's a custom uh, update processor which can actually identify the language of the content and then inject those prefixes automatically for you. In that scenario, we actually do it, insert it as uh, multiple values into the field. They get analyzed independently, but um, once you get all the way down to the point where you've got text and you're analyzing it and creating the token stream, um, at that point, it's not really a multi-valued field. Like it is a multi, it's got multiple tokens in the field. It's an analyzed field, but um, it's a single stream of tokens that we can bind down to when we put it into the index. Yeah. So if if, if you're if you, the question is, are they in the same position? If you're, um, say I've got English and then I've got German, and the analysis chains are, chains are exactly the same, other than the stimmer is different, then those terms will all be in the same position all the way across the token stream, and they'll get stacked. And then if you do a remove duplicates token filter, you can actually condense down so you're not putting the token in multiple times. So you actually get a, a large space savings versus what you would have if you sorted across multiple fields, because we basically, every unique token within a position gets indexed, but you wouldn't index duplicate tokens per language. So that, that I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and call, if you guys have questions more, please come up. I'm gonna let you guys uh, go get some lunch. Um, and the lady who asked me that last question, you can have the other book. So, all right, thank you guys, appreciate it.